My name is Jeffrey Cohen. I'm a professor in the Graduate School of Education and in the Department of Psychology, and also by courtesy in the Graduate School of Business at Stanford University. My name is David Sherman. I'm a professor of psychology in the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences at the University of California, Santa Barbara. The title of our chapter for the annual review is The Psychology of Change, Self-Affirmation, and Social Psychological Intervention. So the purpose of the chapter, um, really we had two goals. Uh, the first goal is to review some of the um, latest and most interesting and important work that's been done with self-affirmation theory, focusing on uh, psychological interventions. And then the, the second part of the goal is, the second part of the uh, second goal of the chapter is to uh, explore ideas related to the psychology of change, how people change, um, and how this has been informed by self-affirmation theory and the work that ourselves and other people in the field uh, have been doing over the past several years. According to self-affirmation theory, which is pioneered again by Claude Steele, uh, people are motivated to maintain a, a global sense of their, their adequacy. Uh, not a specific self-concept. And that's really the, the crux of the theory, that people want a sort of overarching picture of themselves as a, a good moral and adaptive actor. Uh, and that idea is, lies at the core of the intervention, because what these interventions do is oftentimes to affirm people in a different domain from the threat. So if I'm stressed out in school, I can, I can buttress up my sense of adequacy by reminding myself of my relationships with my family. It's all predicated on this powerful self-system wherein simply reflecting on a domain in which one's life is going well, one's relationships with one's family, is not an isolated act. People take it and they run with it and they feel as though that makes them a good person more generally, which assures them that they can uh, cope with a specific threatening circumstance. Mm -hmm. I think this, uh, this self-system um, is, uh, it's helpful to think of it as, as a flexible system that we are constantly bombarded with potential threats to how we see ourselves. Um, you know, our, our sports team loses a game, you have to give a speech in, in public, uh, interpersonal slights, relationship problems, um, all these things can threaten us um, and threaten how we see ourselves. Um, nevertheless, we aren't walking around for the most part uh, feeling uh, as though you know, we're, we're worthless. How do we maintain this overall feeling of ourselves as being capable and adaptive despite all these threats? Well, I think the, a flexible self-system that can respond to threats in one part of our lives by affirming ourselves in another is, is key to how uh, people sustain themselves uh, in the face of threats. Um, and also how they can go beyond threats and actually learn from the, uh, the difficult circumstances that are in their lives. Um, a lot of times, the information that might be threatening, it could be this, this challenge that you have, this speech you have to give, or this, uh, this uh, difficult situation you have to navigate, is also an opportunity for growth. And by importing um, some self-worth from another domain, it helps us uh, uh, kind of go beyond and deal with this threatening domain in a more uh, adaptive and capable way. One of the big headline points that we talk about in the chapter is that a, a brief and relatively low-cost intervention known as a self-affirmation uh, has persistently or can have persistently positive effects on important social outcomes uh, in the domains of education, health, and relationships in the right time and in the right place. Uh, the intervention was a, uh, it's called the self-affirmation. It was pioneered in research by Claude Steele and his colleagues. Uh, and with the self-affirmation, what a self-affirmation is, is an act that expresses one's global adequacy, one's uh, adaptive and moral, moral adequacy. And many um, kinds of activities can uh, affirm the self in this way, uh, but the, inter the intervention that has been uh, most widely studied is one that's called a values affirmation. Uh, and with a values affirmation, what people do is to write about an important value that they hold, uh, such as relationships with friends and family, 
religion, creativity. And they complete this exercise at a moment of stress or a psychological threat. And what this intervention enables people to do is to, to pull back and, and get a wider perspective on a difficult situation so that it consumes less resources and commands less vigilance. It kind of gives people a more expansive view of the self so that a specific threat doesn't loom as large. Uh, and a lot of research has found that these brief writing exercises can, under some circumstances, have relatively large effects on outcomes that we care about. Uh, one study by David Cresswell uh, demonstrated, for instance, that uh, when people had to give an impromptu speech in front of a judgmental audience, a typical sort of stressor task in, in psychological research, uh, most people, when they have to do this, show a bump in the stress hormone cortisol because it's a stressful situation. Uh, but what he found is that when uh, the participants had the opportunity to reflect on an important value that they held, such as their relationships, before giving the speech, uh, they no longer showed that bump in the stress hormone cortisol. Uh, so it's as though what the intervention enables people to do is to take a step back, get a sort of overarching view on the self and its resources so that a specific stressor doesn't command as much vigilance, consume as much resources, and indict the self. Often when people experience uh, threats to self, they become consumed by that threat. And they'll try to take steps to mitigate the threat or reduce the threat. And this can often result in uh, defensive or self-serving judgments about the threatening information. Uh, so for example, when people uh, see health information that suggests that they put themselves at risk for some disease, instead of responding uh, adaptively and changing their health behaviors, in part because it's often difficult to do, um, they respond many times by kind of denying that the, the, the risk is relevant to them, um, criticizing the health information in there and uh, having and kind of shunning in general the information. For example, uh, when uh, women are given an article linking uh, caffeine use with negative health outcomes, when the women were coffee drinkers, this is work that was done originally by Ziva Kunda, when the women were coffee drinkers, um, they really engaged their critical faculties and said, no, you know, those studies were poorly conducted that information is not relevant. But if they were given a chance to affirm themselves uh, in some other part of them, their, their lives, writing about something that's important, or bringing online these important values, they were more open to the health information. And there have now been many studies, and this is a big part of the review, um, where we uh, elaborate um, and discuss why it is and how it is that these values affirmations can make people more open to otherwise threatening uh, health information. Writing about an important value uh, can create a, a moment of potential change that opens people up to otherwise threatening information that they might be defensive towards, as in the uh, study that David mentioned, uh, or that enables people to show what they know and perform up to their potential. Uh, for instance, there's research that shows when people are self-affirmed in a highly stressful situation, uh, they are better able to marshal their cognitive resources to perform up to their potential. Uh, for example, solving more creative problems in a stressful uh, public examination. So the sort of um, big picture point of a lot of this research is that under certain circumstances, when psychological threat or stress inhibits people, prevents them from uh, uh, performing up to their potential, opening up to information that's in their self-interest, a an affirmation kind of an affirmation can create a, a moment of potential change so that people can uh, accept the threatening information and uh, perform up to their abilities. Um, uh, in specific circumstances. That's not always the case, and we uh, review it, uh, other research that shows that there are certain cases where uh, psychological threat might actually be an asset, and in those situations, affirming the self may have counterproductive effects. But in a lot of domains, uh, we our abilities and our performance and our uh, openness to change are often compromised by psychological threat, the sense that uh, 
our narrative of self is, is, is in question and affirmations can open people up to a moment of change. So the um, focus of a lot of the research is on affirmation interventions. And um, by uh, interventions, we're talking about studies, uh, many of them field experiments, where kind of building on a lot of the studies that we've previously mentioned, which were mostly conducted in the laboratory and carefully uh, controlled environments, um, to in part see how this plays out in the real world. Um, the kind of next generation of affirmation research moved into the field. Um, and uh, this uh, began um, in some studies that were done in, uh, for example, uh, sporting events, looking at athletes who had just won or lost a game and seeing the types of attributions they made for that. Um, but where it really took off uh, and uh, became uh, pretty exciting was with work on educational interventions. Uh, what they do is to uh, have children, often uh, uh, children at the onset of adolescence is where much of the research has taken place, uh, in, in, engage in a values affirmation at the beginning of the school year or the transition to middle school. Uh, so for example, in one study, uh, teachers distributed to their children in a classroom uh, the, a, values a series of values affirmation exercises. And what these were were uh, packets that were given out to kids throughout the school year, roughly three to five times, say, in, in seventh grade. And the kids on the day of the intervention would uh, open up the packet, and the packet would guide them through reflecting on an important value. First, they would select a value that's important to them, such as relationships or religion, uh, or art or music and then the kids would write about why that value was important to them in, in various ways. And in a control condition, uh, the children completed similar packets but they were about neutral topics such as an unimportant value or their morning routine. And the exercises took on average about 10 minutes each session and again occurred about three to five times each year. And then what was done was to follow these kids over the course of their middle school careers, uh, usually one to three years, depending on the study. And it was found that the children who completed the affirmation interventions did better academically. For example, in one study, the percentage of uh, African-American children who completed the affirmation dropped from 20% in the control condition to 9% in the affirmation condition. That's the percentage of children who uh, got a D or F uh, in, in the course in which the intervention was given in the first quarter after its administration. Um, and then what was done was to track the kids uh, over the course of one to three years and it was found that on average the effects persisted uh, such that those children uh, in this, uh, the children who completed the intervention uh, continue to do better academically, not only in the year in which the intervention was received, but actually a year or two after that as well. They, they continue to do better academically. Uh, in all these cases, though, there's a, a critical conditionality. Um, the intervention doesn't work for everyone. It's not a main effect. Instead, it works consistently for the group or individual that is under the most chronic psychological threat in a particular setting. Uh, so in this case, that was uh, expected to be uh, students who contend with negative stereotypes about their group, such as African Americans or Latino Americans. They, they contend with threatening stereotypes about their group and in academic situations, uh, given work by Claude Steele on stereotype threat, they may be uh, more likely to worry that other people could see them in light of that negative stereotype, which could cause stress and undermine performance. So in each of these educational field experiments, it was found that it was the threatened group, the psychologically threatened group, in, in many cases uh, negatively stereotyped minority students, who benefited from the intervention, whereas the other students did not. And so we have a, uh, a recent paper that came out this year in 2013 um, that Jeff and I and our, our collaborators uh, worked on. That, um, that extended these initial findings uh, looking at uh, uh, schools uh, that consisted of Latino Americans primarily and, and white 
uh, middle school students. And our goal in that uh, paper was first to see whether the initial findings that were obtained with, uh, with uh, the beneficial effects of the affirmation with African Americans would also be obtained from another group for whom there's um, a potential stereotype about their academic performance, uh, in this case, uh, Latino American uh, children. And in fact, uh, the affirmation was beneficial for the Latino American students. Um, but beyond that, um, demonstrating the effect, we also wanted to understand better the underlying psychology. And so we uh, included uh, measures and assessments throughout the school year. And one of these measures was uh, a way of tapping how students are perceiving their daily threats, uh, the da their daily experience. Um, all students experience ups and downs. And what we think is a, uh, a symptom or evidence of this stereotype threat is whether or not you encode these daily ups and downs in terms of something that's meaningful about your ethnic or your racial group. So what we found was that for the Latino Americans in the control condition, on the days that they experience stress, just regular plain old stress, they encoded that to a greater extent in terms of something about their group. This was not a problem that the white students uh, had to contend with. This is not a, a burden uh, that they have to deal with. The affirmation, though, seemed to change the story that the students were telling to themselves about their daily experience, such that when they experienced stress, they did not see it as linked to their racial or ethnic group. And moreover, to the extent to which they thought that there was some uh, potential slight or problem uh, that was kind of focused to, on their racial group, it didn't undermine their uh, sense of academic efficacy, or their feeling that they belonged. So it seems as though the intervention, uh, by reassuring them of who they are and what's important to them, um, led to this late, uh, lasting changing in perspective, uh, such that they were not as, um, not as affected by the, the dailies, daily ups and downs as they might otherwise have been. Uh, one important point to emphasize in all these intervention studies that we discuss uh, is the idea that values affirmations are not panaceas, but uh, act more like catalysts. Uh, what they do is they activate inhibited behavioral potentials. So they, they depend critically on what's already there in the child and in the school or in people's motivational structure. Um, so in the case of the school studies that we discussed, um, what seems very critical, for instance, is that there are resources for growth in the school environment, opportunities to learn, a solid curriculum. And what interventions like self-affirmation, as well as other social psychological interventions uh, more generally that we, we touch on, uh, what they do is to kind of clear the psychological space or the, the psychological air so that people can better seize the resources uh, and show what they know and seize the resources for, for growth and learning in their environment. So a lot of times when we're under stress, we don't perform up to our, our potential, like as when we sort of choke under pressure, or if a, if a kid feels very uh, unsure about whether other people will stereotype him or her, uh, the student might be less inclined to uh, ask a teacher for help when they need it. Uh, what an intervention like affirmation and other social psychological interventions do is to create a sort of sense of assurance, uh, uh, a sense of adaptive adequacy that gives people the confidence to engage with the resources that are, are, are available to them. And in that way, they, they really do critically hinge on what's in the environment already. They lift a restraining force that's kind of inhibiting the potential of the person and the system, and in doing so, enable the person and, and the resources in the system to better express their full impact. One point that we uh, try to uh, elaborate on is how um, a change in the self can lead to a change in your environment, and that can feed back and affect the self. So for example, um, if you feel uh, somewhat less stressed and you might perform better, your teacher might respond to you in such a way 
um, as to start affirming you, um, recognizing your potential, uh, seeing you as the type of child who can succeed. Um, and when you get that feedback from the teacher, um, then that could fill you with, with greater confidence um, and inspire you to perform even better. And so this is, helps us, this process of, of recursion helps us to understand how these seemingly small interventions can have these relatively long-lasting effects, uh, such that we can observe their impact in, in terms of things like GPA over the course of years. Um, it's because it's not that the affirmed state sort of magically persists over time, it's that it's causing changes in the person which can lead to changes in the environment, and that environment can then feed back and, and sustain the initial effects. We call this a, a cycle of adaptive potential, and it's the idea that the self-system and the social system can kind of play off of each other in mutually reinforcing interactions over time. Uh, so I think implicit in this view is the idea that the self-system is a, is a powerful system, that an input into the system, such as writing about a an important value is not just an isolated act, but in the context of the self-system, people, people run with it. They, they assert what's important to them and they go from that to say, and that makes me a good person, and being a good person means that I can cope. And they can thus uh, perform better than they might otherwise have been able to under psychological threat. Now, the social system can respond in ways that reinforce the, the the student's performance or the individual's positive behavior and affirm the individual. And so you can get these reciprocal interactions such that a kid performs better, their teachers notice them uh, and hold them to a higher expectation and that in turn reaffirms the kid so that they feel an even greater sense that they belong. And I, I, We really think that this idea of a cycle of adaptive potential, the reciprocal interactions between the self-system and the social system over time helps to explain a lot of when and how interventions or experiences in general can have lasting effects, both for good and for ill. An exciting area to see emerge is uh, affirmations being used in uh, the context of healthcare. Uh, there were an exciting series of studies, uh, I believe four of which uh, were published in the Archives of Internal Medicine that used affirmation-inspired interventions to uh, help patients interact better with their doctors or uh, to encourage patients to uh, be more likely to comply with their medical regimens. And what this work uh, was premised on was the idea that health is a psychologically threatening domain, perhaps one of the most threatening domains that uh, many of us have, where we're continually dealing with uh, threats to our sense of adequacy, our mortality and morbidity is, are among the, the strongest threats to our sense of adequacy. And what these can do is to get in the way of effective self-care. If people are defensive about their health, they might be less likely to uh, comply with their medical regimens. They might be more defensive towards information that uh, they could benefit from for their health status. They might be more nervous and stressed out in their interactions with their doctors. And this can undermine their ability to uh, get as much benefit as they can out of, their, uh, out of the healthcare system. So um, in this series of studies, to make a long story short, uh, they showed that uh, giving patients affirmation-inspired interventions uh, where they encourage patients, for example, to reflect on proud moments in their lives, increased uh, in two out of three uh, medical trials and then one uh, separate field exper experiment, uh, positive outcomes for, for patients. Uh, so for example, it increased hypertensive, uh, poor hypertensive African Americans' uh, use of their hypertension uh, medical treatment. And in another study, it increased African American patients' Uh, uh, the quality of their interaction and communication with their, their physicians. That their, it was found that uh, when patients completed an affirmation before meeting with their, their health care provider, the uh, interactions for those patients between them and their doctor evinced more warmth, more positive affect, and a greater exchange of information than it did when the patients were, were not affirmed.
So this is a, an example of uh, how this work is uh, busting through boundaries, uh, the boundary of social psychology to make inroads into other domains, including health. One of the points we make in the paper is that no psychological process is an island, that once a child starts performing better or a hypertensive patient starts taking their medications, other things come out of that. There can be a snowball effect of positive consequences. Uh, in addition, the, the social environment might start responding more positively to the person once they start uh, losing weight, for example, or performing better in school. Uh, which can uh, create a, a domino effect of consequences uh, that help propel forward the effects of an intervention through time. I think one of the key points that we're trying to emphasize in this review is the idea that uh, people exist in a, uh, a system of interdependent forces and processes. And so if you change one thing, other things can change as a consequence in the right time and in the right place. And what I think a lot of these interventions demonstrate is that well-timed, well-situated interventions can, under some circumstances, lead to a cascade of consequences through these processes of recursion, interaction, and changes in the way people subjectively construe their social worlds that endure with time. One really critical point is the conditionality of these intervention effects. Again, they're they're conditional on what's already there. So for it to benefit school performance, there has to be resources to grow. For it to benefit health, there has to be a quality healthcare system from which people can get effective medical regimens. So the affirmation acts as a catalyst. Um, and it's not, and just at the, in order to make clear that we're not Pollyannish, the interventions given this analysis can sometimes have negative effects. Uh, for example, in one study where people's identity as an open-minded negotiator was made salient. So people really cared about being open-minded. In that situation, when people were affirmed, they actually became more closed-minded because the intervention freed them from the, the shackle of the psychological threat around their open-minded identity. Uh, in another study by Kathleen Vose and colleagues, they demonstrate that under some circumstances, for instance, when people encounter repeated failure over and over in a domain, that affirmation can actually backfire and lead people to disengage, which actually might be a, an adaptive response in that kind of situation where one is just encountering failure over and over. Again, that's why the conditionality of the effects are very important to consider, opportunities for growth, for improvement. When the situation is right, affirmation can be like a spark to kindling.